there's no theoretical upper limit that you can grow a black hole to. Mm. The challenge is just throwing Getting enough stuff yeah. Yeah. into the black hole. Um, and it turns out that, that it's pretty hard to, I say our universe is only 13.9 billion years old, which yeah. might sound like a long time, but when you want to throw this much material down a hole, it's, <laughs> it's not that much time. What's up, you scholars of enlightenment? Dr. Sam Gregson, particle physicist here again. I hope you've had a fantastic week and have a really exciting weekend in store. Now, a couple of weeks ago, astronomers claimed to have discovered one of the largest black holes ever. The ultramassive black hole has an estimated mass of 33 billion suns, putting it in the top 10 most massive black holes ever discovered. And it's thought to be on the upper limit of how large black holes can theoretically become. To help me understand this fascinating discovery, how it was made, how it compares to previous observations, and what it means for black hole science, I'm joined by a fantastic special guest, Dr. Dan Wilkins. Dr. Wilkins is a research scientist, astronomer, and astrophysicist in the Kavli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology, at Stanford University. His research bridges the divide between observational and theoretical studies of black holes using state-of-the-art telescopes, developing novel data analysis techniques, and designing computer simulations of how light travels around black holes. So who better to help me dig into this observation of an ultra-massive black hole? So, uh, Dan, we're told that a new ultra-massive black hole with a mass of roughly 33 billion suns and a radius of more than 1,300 astronomical units, so that's the distance between the, the Earth and the sun, has been discovered. Now, how does this mass and size compare to those of previous black hole candidates? This, this isn't the biggest, right? Uh, probably not the biggest. I mean, it's certainly up there in the top 10 or so okay. of biggest supermassive black holes we've ever found. But truth is, when you start looking at black holes that are that big and also this far away, it gets a little bit tricky to exactly measure right. their masses. So, so now, now I'm understanding what the news articles did. They said possibly the biggest. So they were, they were playing with those uncertainty ranges and trying to uh, beef up their headline, I guess. Yeah, so that rank order of the, the top black holes, it, it can move around yeah, depending yeah, yeah, on what sense. you believe on the uncertainties. <laughs> Good stuff. So um, in the top 10 candidates, the previous one seemed to be about 10 billion suns. What about the, the radius here? This is 1,300 astronomical units, which is apparently 30 times the, si the, the size of the solar system. What, have the, what was the previous record roughly in terms of mass and, and size? Do you, do you know? Um, so the, the radius of a black hole just scales yeah. exactly with its mass. Yeah. So if the, the previous black hole was 10 billion compared to 30 billion, it's just going to be three times smaller. Okay. okay, fine. So so there's kind of a degeneracy there. We're talking about exactly the same thing. So how how is this ultra massive black hole? So we're talking about a mass of 33 billion times the sun. How is it likely to have come about? Is this... Is this just a probability distribution where we've got lucky to find one that's on the big end or is it potentially several black holes that have merged or, or something else? How are these ultra massive black holes likely to come about? So this is an interesting question. It turns out when you really look closely at the massive black holes, we don't quite understand how they got as big as they are. It's a good scientist answer, right? We're not we're not too sure. Lots to lots to find. Yeah, out. so. So the, the kind of the classic picture we've got here is that the, the black hole starts off with whatever its seed is. It's um, either a star that comes to the end of its life or it's some material in the center of the galaxy that collapsed into a black hole. And that gives you a seed that'll be a lot smaller yeah. than the black hole that, that we see today. And then that will either grow by just swallowing material from its surroundings yeah. or if two galaxies collide with each other, then their black holes will end up sinking down to the center of the, the new combined galaxy and they'll end up spiraling into mm. each other and then merging 
into a bigger black hole. Um, and what's kind of kind of interesting in, in this one, actually, it, it looks like maybe there's a few hints that that this black hole did grow by by merging with um, by merging smaller black holes together. Um, when you look closely at the the gas that surround this galaxy, so the, the thing with this galaxy, it's it's not a normal galaxy like like ours. It's not just sitting alone in in empty space. This is in what's called a cluster. Mm. So this is thousand or so galaxies that all live together and are held together by gravity. And these um, these galaxies are surrounded by gas that's a few million degrees. Mm. So it's like a, a kind of conurbation of galaxies, if you like. These this sort of exactly, they're all just yeah. joined joined together, continuous sort of um, region of of matter and gravitational interaction. Yeah, and we can actually see in that hot gas that's around the galaxies little structures that maybe look like things that could have been carved out by those galaxies colliding with each other and merging, mm -hmm. and also the way the stars seem to be distributed in this galaxy that, that harbors this ultramassive black hole, there's maybe some hints that the way the stars were arranged in the center results from the, the two black holes that merged kind of spiraling around each other. And this kind of works like a blender in the center of the galaxy, mixing everything around and pulling all the stars around. So there's some, yeah, maybe some interesting hints that, that we're actually seeing the results of a merger here. Interesting. So not only do we believe that we found this, we're going to talk about the method in a little bit, but there's also maybe some some hints as to how it potentially came about. That's uh, yeah. that's very very interesting. So in terms of before we get onto the method and, and and those kind of things, is there any impact of this on the field? So you said this might not be the biggest black hole candidate we've seen before. Um, you know, we we've, we've potentially seen bigger. Is it, does this discovery have any impact on the field of black holes that you study? Is is this is there any revelatory insight from this or is it just interesting for the outside observer because of the sheer scale of the size of this black hole and so i think the the new method here is the big thing being able to see black holes that we weren't able to see before um but just finding the these ultramassive black holes it's not the biggest black hole we've ever found we know these these ultramassive black holes exist but just finding more and more of them is telling us that those few ultramassive ones we found before, yeah. they're not just some anomaly we can ignore. These, This is a real phenomenon in our yeah. universe. And it, and it poses real challenges, actually. One of the things we found is these, these really big black holes existed not just in recent times in our local universe, but if we look into the distant universe... So we're looking so far away that the light has taken mm -hmm. so long to get to us that we're looking at the universe as it was billions of years in the past. We actually see these really big black holes grew very early on in our universe. So they must have grown really quickly. And that's a, a real challenge for our understanding <laughs> just how much stuff you can throw into a black hole. I think we're gonna we're gonna come on to a little bit a little bit more of that later. So that's a nice uh, that's a nice prep for that. So is there a theoretical upper limit? So so we've seen these large candidates before, as you said, and I've seen various articles doing a, a quick bit of cursory research. Some teams seem to say that you can't get above 50 billion suns. Some say there's no theoretical upper limit. Are these, are these limits that come from essentially evolutions of the universe? So we, we don't expect them to be above that limit, but there's actually no hard cutoff or is there a is there a physical limit to the the upper size of these black holes that we expect yeah that's exactly right so in terms of the fundamental physics of a black hole if we believe general relativity is the the theory that describes them there's no theoretical upper limit that you can grow a black hole to mm. the challenge is just throwing Getting enough together. stuff yeah. Yeah. into the black hole um, and it turns out that that it's pretty hard to I say a universe is only 13.9 billion years old, which yeah. might sound like a long time, but when you want to throw this much material down a hole, it's <laughs> it's not that much time. You you really need to throw gas into these things quickly. And if you try to do that too quickly, you start running into some, some problems. Um, so that when you throw gas into a black hole, that gas heats up. 
I mean, that this is the way we see most of the black holes we yeah. know about. Yeah. They produce the amazing bright light sources. Yeah. Just material falling in heats up and releases energy. Some, uh, uh, but that radiation and light that's coming out of that material falling into the black hole actually is then able to push onto material right. that's trying to fall in. So you've got material trying to fall into the black hole, but then the radiation is pushing it outwards. So you kind of get this, this tug of war going on that limits the, the amount of material you can throw. Now it turns out nature, we've seen, has found some ways to get around that. <laughs> um, but then another problem you have is um, that, that nice disk of gas you're showing there throwing, uh, falling into the black hole. Yeah. If you try and put too much material into that disk, um, then the material in the disk also starts to interact with itself. It starts to form little clumps. And then you end up not having this disk of gas falling into the black hole, but you end up growing a lot of stars. Um, and then you form a load of stars around the black hole that then take much longer to fall in. So yeah. that, um, again, that that slows down the, the amount of stuff you can throw in. So going much above this kind of 50 billion seems inconsistent with kind of the picture of the universe that we see in the structures in the universe that we that we see in the models that we have. Is that is that fair? Yeah, exactly right. And yeah, it's it's hard to to understand how we can throw enough gas into the black hole in the thirteen point nine billion years <laughs> we've had since the beginning of the universe to to get anything much heavier than that. And unless you can find some new loophole or new way to to get yeah. around these limits, so you can get a lot done in thirteen point nine billion years, but but not necessarily a black hole much bigger than than we've seen. So so. That gives me one more question before we move on to the onto the method of, by which this ultramassive black hole candidate was found, and that's what is kind of the mass distribution of of black holes that we see. Then, so we we talked about these being on the kind of upper end of uh, of those uh, sizes of black holes. Working at the Large Hadron Collider, there were some theoretical ideas about microscopic black holes, which didn't really pan out. We see these kind of um, I hesitate to say normal sized black holes that come from, you know, at the end of uh, stellar lifetimes. We've obviously got the supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies. Now we're talking about ultramassive black holes. I assume this is not a, a uniform distribution. So how, how are these how are these masses of black holes? How do they tend to be distributed? I guess if the if the larger ones come from um, conglomerations of the smaller, you'd expect them to kind of fall off. But. Can you give us a little bit more detail about that distribution? Um, yeah, so we we kind of think about black holes in astrophysics terms as falling into two categories. So what you call the normal black holes, those are what we call the stellar mass black oh, holes. Sorry, I, I know I shouldn't have used the word normal, but I couldn't oh, think of yeah. anything. <laughs> well, as someone who's made a career um, uh, studying the supermassive black holes. To you, it's it? like, oh, them. Oh, no, 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the, the, the stellar mass black holes, these are the ones that form at the end of the lives mm. of massive stars. So you have a, a star that's more than about 10 times the mass of our sun comes to the end of its life, and then it blows up potentially in a supernova explosion. Mm. And then if you have enough material left after the supernova explosion, so we're not worried here about the original mass of the star, but what's left behind mm. after you blow all this stuff up in the supernova. If enough stuff is left behind, that can collapse mm. and form a black hole. And those black holes can be a few times the mass of the sun up to a couple of 10 times the mass of the sun. And are these are these the most, the most common that we believe exist? Um, probably yes, just in terms of statistics. Yeah. Um, so you... And, because then the other end, we've got the supermassive black holes. We yeah. believe that every galaxy has a supermassive black hole at its center, but then every galaxy will have billions and billions yeah. of yeah. stars. Makes, in makes it. sense, yeah. yeah. Probably a few billion of those will become black holes as well. Yeah. So then we've got the, yeah, the, the supermassive black holes that are formed at the centers of galaxies, and those are millions to billions of times the, the mass of the sun. Mm -hmm. And these ultramassive black holes are probably just the tail end of of that same mm. population. Um, so, but then so, we have those those two groups in the middle and that's where things get a little bit less clear. Okay. So there's these things called intermediate mass black holes that are a few thousand times the mass of the sun. Um, these, they're not quite big enough to be the supermassive ones in the centers of the big galaxies, but they're too big to be stellar mass black holes. Okay. 
Um, but these could be the um, sort of the, the smaller black holes that are found at the center of the smaller galaxies or the, mm. the dwarf galaxies. Mm. Interesting. Um, and then the gravitational wave experiments have then found um, another group. So the gravitational waves are probing what we think should have been stellar mass black holes. So uh, two stars living in a binary, both form black holes. You end up with the two black holes orbiting around each other and then they merge and produce the gravitational waves that we measure. Those should be in that kind of few to a few 10 solar masses range, but it turns out that the ones we're seeing are actually a bit heavier and they're more like 50 to, to 100. Mm. We're not quite sure what's happening there. Maybe there's the way those stars formed and died um, leaves bigger black holes, but there's still a bit of a mystery there. Interesting. So there's, there's quite a lot of... Um structure in that in that mass distribution of black holes because they're coming from essentially from different different groups and and very very interesting stuff so this new ultra massive black hole to come onto the method of how it was found was discovered by an entirely new method which you kind of teed up can you tell us um a little bit about how that method works and and, and how it kind of um uh dovetails with other methods of finding black holes um, yeah, so normally the, the black holes that we observe in our universe, at least the ones we observe through light, hmm. are the, the black holes that are actively feeding on material. So whether that's a load of gas in the center of a galaxy falling into a black hole, or a stellar mass black hole that's stealing gas from a companion star, we see those just because the material falling into the black hole gets heated and it produces some of the brightest light sources we see across the universe. So we that usually limits... see a lot because they're accreting material and therefore putting out light that we can actually see, despite the fact that, you know, the black hole is invisible, quote unquote, the material around it is giving out so much energy that we can we can see these these objects. Exactly. But the problem with doing that is that then limits us to only seeing the black holes that are currently feeding. And bias it and biases towards us that, that that type of black hole, I guess. Yeah. So, so this new method works on um, a principle called gravitational lensing. Um, and this goes back to the same theory that predicts black holes, um, Einstein's theory of general relativity, which is the best theory we have to understand how gravity works in our universe. Well, as particle physicists, we don't talk about gravity too much, Dan. We don't, we don't, we don't like it so much. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, gravity to you is what quantum physics is to us. <laughs> it refuses to behave properly. We're just like no good. It's classical over there, no good. <laughs> Yeah, so, so the idea of general relativity is that gravity comes about because whenever we have some mass or some material in space, it produces a dent in space itself. So when we have a black hole or a massive galaxy or even a star or just a planet, the space around that object is bent, it's warped. So that means anything that tries to travel through that space won't be able to travel necessarily in a straight line, but its path will curve towards the object. And mm. that, that moving of things towards a massive object is what we experience as the force of gravity. Mm. And crucially, it's not just massive objects that feel the force of gravity. Light also has to travel across these curves in space. So that means light also gets bent under the force of gravity when it passes by massive objects. And this means that whenever we have a massive object, it essentially behaves like a lens. So this, this picture you're, you're showing here is the, the thing labeled galaxy is the object we're looking at. So that's an object far away. Yeah. But then the light from that galaxy has to pass by another galaxy that's nearer to us. Yeah. So the light from that distant galaxy gets bent like a lens around that nearby galaxy so instead of that background galaxy appearing like a nice blob or spiral on the sky its image gets distorted and it gets stretched out into these rings or arcs on the sky so kind of like if you were, you're trying to read a newspaper by looking through the the stalk of a wine glass or something yeah. it's yeah thing but the the exact shape that this image gets distorted into 
depends on how the the matter is arranged yeah. in whatever that lens is in the center. And what was really crucial about this discovery is they 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 knew about this lens before. Mm. Uh, so they, they'd already discovered that this background galaxy got stretched into that arc you see yeah. at the top of the, the image. Yeah. But then they went back and observed this system again using the Hubble Space Telescope that gives us much better resolution on this, this image. And what they found is that closer to the, the center of the, the lens galaxy, so here the, the background galaxy is that arc at the top right, mm. And the, the lens galaxy is that dark blob in the center. That's the galaxy nearer to us that's doing the lensing. What they find is that when you take out the light from the lens galaxy, you find not just that one big arc, but you see a much smaller arc that's closer to the, the center of the lens. And by playing around with different models of how the material in that galaxy is distributed. So uh, trying out different arrangements of the stars in the galaxy, the dark matter in that galaxy, um, and also whether or not there's a, a black hole in the center of the galaxy, they find that the only way they can produce this, this tiny second arc that they see with Hubble is by having not just the stars and dark matter in the galaxy, but by having that black hole in the center. You need some really small concentrated mm. amount of mass right in the center of the galaxy to be able to produce that, that second image of the, the galaxy in the background. Very, very interesting. So, so you're essentially saying what lens would have had to exist to create the image that I'm seeing in my telescope? So like, yeah. like, for example, if you were looking at, a, you know, a landscape in the background, you're looking through, like you said, the bottom of a wine bottle or something. What distortions would have to be on that lens for me to see the picture that I'm actually getting at my eye? And you can you can infer what's the the mass distribution in that lens. I guess that raises some questions about about what assumptions go into that. So I guess you need to very have a very good understanding of what you expect to see behind, which I guess you were kind of alluding to that they'd seen this, this lens before. Um, what, what kind of assumptions go into that and how, how solid are they? Yeah. So the, the couple of assumptions you have to make is first of all, you, you need some assumption about what shape the galaxy and the, the background yeah. is. Yeah. Um, but so long as the galaxy is not too weird, so long as it looks like a fairly normal galaxy, like a spiral or an ellipse yeah. or something, then 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 it's pretty robust to that. So long as you don't have like some weird stalk. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, you, but you can kind of get around that. You can kind of get around that problem because you know that that big arc and the small arc have to be images have of the to same be come from the same. So you've got a, a kind so of degeneracy there to play with. Yeah, that really helps you there. Yeah. So the the big assumptions in this uh, are what ingredients you put into that lens galaxy, that galaxy nearer to us that's that's bending the light. Um, and the way they do this is they build up models using different components. And the components that they put in are based on the thousands and thousands and thousands of galaxies that we've observed yeah. all over the universe. So if this galaxy is similar in structure to, to pretty much all the other galaxies in, in our universe, then we can, we can build up this model. So we, we have a pretty good idea of how stars are arranged in galaxies. So we can put in the population of stars. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we can see the population of stars yeah. as well because yeah. they shine. So we can just look through the telescope and see where the stars are. Yeah and then relate the, the light from the stars to the, the mass of the stars. Um, we then have to put in the dark matter, um, but we've got good models and actually pretty good measurements now of how dark matter is arranged around galaxies. Um, and the dark matter is really important here because um, something like 90% of the material in a galaxy isn't luminous matter. It's yeah. not stuff that we can see that either shines or absorbs light it's dark matter that doesn't interact with light at all. So the, the dark matter is really important in understanding how the um, the light gets bent around this object. Um, and then finally, you have the the black hole in the center, and that's really easy to put in. That's yeah. essentially just a point that you. That you it's have. nice. It's nice that it, like you said that the the mass and the radius 
it's just a blob. Like you said, it's not it's not some weird things with structures out in different directions, which would give a lot of parameters you have to play with. It's essentially a you know a, a sphere of mass that goes in goes in the middle, I guess. And, and the nice thing is here as well is um, we can actually use um, um, a technique called a, a Bayesian evidence calculation. And that means we don't just have to use one set of assumptions and just hope they're correct and see what that gives us for the black hole in the center. We can actually try out a whole range of different models for yeah. what this galaxy is built of. And we can let the data tell us yeah. which of those models it prefers, which of the different models and different sets of assumptions are best. Um, and then when we have a few different models that are equally good descriptions of the galaxy, then they might have slightly different masses for the black hole in the center but then when we say this is the mass of the black hole and this is our uncertainty on yeah, that yeah. we can just incorporate that into into our uncertainty and, that, and that's why it's it's kind of 30 billion <laughs> plus or minus um about 20 billion <laughs> yeah and that's why it could be the biggest or it, or it might not be the biggest but yes so very 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 interesting so how do you foresee this technique being used going forward i guess we go look for more lenses and, and therefore build up um, a category of quieter black holes, perhaps? Um, yeah, definitely. So we now know of a huge number of gravitational lenses. And um, and this the sample of them we have is only getting bigger with the, the James Webb Space yeah. Telescope. Yeah. And one of the, the amazing things we saw from JWST is just in one of those first teaser images they released the, the first set of images yep. they sent out was of a galaxy cluster similar to this one and you could immediately see by eye that 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 jwst image just had so much sensitivity that we were just seeing gravitational lenses popping up hmm. all over it so there's there's a huge number of lenses we can search and um, can analyze in exactly the same way um, we'll have to find out how many of those actually find black holes? Mm. Remember, one of the things here is that we're finding a black hole that is ultramassive. We're yeah. finding something yeah. 30 billion solar masses. So yeah. I think there's a question as to whether this technique would be able to discover the more normal supermassive black holes that are maybe a million, 10 million, a billion solar masses. Yeah. Um, whether you have the sensitivity to those smaller ones or if you can only find the, these these really ultramassive black holes. But but yeah, it's, it certainly is a, a breakthrough being able to to see black holes in our universe that, that aren't feeding and just get a clearer picture of just what the population of black holes is out there. Very, very interesting. And I, get, I guess with those lenses, you talked about the, the kind of constraints in the modeling because you had those those two arcs. I guess it's not just gonna, going to necessarily work this method for every single lens that we find. You might have to have particular characteristics of that lens, I guess. So so you, you're gonna have some, you're not gonna just be able to look at every lens and start seeing these black holes propping out all over the place, right? Um, yeah, so you'll, yeah, you, 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 it, the question is what what properties of the lens do you need to yeah. be able to, to yeah. see the properties whether that is just the ultramassive black holes that that give us this or yeah. or if this technique would be sensitive to yeah the smaller ones yeah exactly so so what is our what is our current understanding of how black holes have developed over cosmic time so you talked about this being a method that allows us to see quieter black holes i guess it also allows us to see black holes that are that are further away you kind of you kind of mentioned that earlier and therefore further back in time is there is there any insight we can get into kind of the evolution of black holes over the the history of our universe and, and any insights we can get there? Um, yeah, so kind of the, um, the picture we have for um, supermassive black holes in the, the centers of galaxies is there's, there's two possible ways they could have formed. Uh, the first one is from stars. So the the first stars that formed in our universe would have been much more massive than the, the stars we see today. Yeah. And when those first stars come to the end of their lives, they would have formed black holes. So then in the center of a galaxy, you have the, these early stars that form black holes. Um, and then all of those black holes end up orbiting around each other, spiraling into each other, and then merging into a, 
um, into the supermassive black hole that we see today. So that, that's one method. And then the, the other way that supermassive black holes could have formed is something that we call direct collapse. So this is where we have enough material left over when a galaxy forms that falls to the center of that galaxy. Mm. And if you have enough material falling into a small enough region of space and the conditions are right, so that it's not too hot, the pressure isn't trying to push mm. it out, then the gravity can take over and just collapse that huge amount of gas just directly into a black hole in the bigger galaxies. Wow. It's kind of these these two methods, and we we don't know whether one of these methods happens or the other happens, or they both happen in in different types of galaxies. Mm. Uh, there's then this more exotic um, picture of um, what are called primordial black holes that maybe could have kick started the whole process and got us round this problem I mentioned earlier that actually these black holes seem to have grown very quickly in the early universe. Um, primordial black holes are kind of the same idea of things directly collapsing into a black hole, but not in a galaxy. This is right back in the, the quantum fluctuations of the early universe. So right after the Big Bang, the kind of the hot soup of um, the hot soup of our universe that has um, these quantum waves traveling through it that give it dense regions and less dense regions. And those are the seeds that, that form the galaxies and the structure that we see today. Mm. But if you have one of those little over dense bits of the early universe, that's a little bit too big, mm. then actually that could just directly collapse into a black mm. hole. And that will give you a black hole right there at the, the beginning of the universe that could then be the seed of a, a black hole that um, that we see today. That's probably the kind um, of thing they were looking for at the LHC. I haven't looked into it too much, but I imagine it seems like these high energy um, potential situations where you could create a black hole. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't looked into that enough. Oh, so, yeah. It's, yeah. I and mean, if you just have, yeah, in the, the, the theory in the LHC is if you have two protons colliding with mm. each other, if those protons get close enough together that they're within their Schwarzschild radius, they'll form yeah. a black hole. But what's kind of neat, actually, is you don't need the LHC to do this. If you can form black holes like this in the LHC, then cosmic rays yeah. will be doing yeah. it all the time in the upper <laughs> atmosphere. And, we're, and we're, we haven't disappeared yet, so we should be okay. So so is there is there any way that this method or or similar methods might be able to help us disentangle which of those methods might have brought about these these supermassive and ultramassive black holes or is this likely to remain yeah. a problem for an unsolved problem for a while so the the key to disentangling the these two methods is first of all understanding just how big a black hole we can get mm. and how early on in the universe those black holes needed to form so that mm. tells us just how quickly this process needs to run and that will rule out a lot of slower things like having to wait for stars to form and stars to die and stars to form a black <laughs> hole then yeah. you can rule out a lot of that if we need to, to make black holes very quickly so it's closing and that parameter space basically there's still there's time and then there's size and that we we need to we need to narrow down that parameter space and then we can get more of a handle on which model is more likely to have been what occurred in what proportion yeah. And the other important thing is actually how many galaxies have a black hole in them, mm. because this, this direct collapse, turning a cloud of gas straight into a black hole, is quite hard to do, particularly if you have a small galaxy. Mm. So if we can find that even the dwarf galaxies in our universe all have black holes in the center, then that will point to the, yeah. the stars playing an important role in forming those as well. So being able to find black holes that aren't feeding and maybe be able to find smaller supermassive black holes in all of the dwarf galaxies, that will also be really important for understanding how they how they got there. Very, very interesting. So there's lots of lots of interesting things still to find. So so Dan, is there any other big news in black hole physics? We haven't we haven't talked about these fascinating objects for a while i've seen i've seen a couple of things come up but uh i'll let you go first is there anything else that people should be aware of in the uh in the field of black hole physics at the moment um yeah there's been a, a few cool things interesting actually um recently so um one of them i can see you've already got up there on the screen <laughs> so um discovering the the closest um black hole to earth um so we know our galaxy is full of stellar mass black holes that form when massive stars come to the end of their lives 
Um, so we expect these to be to be all over the galaxy, but yeah, just finding the um, the one closest to us. And actually, kind of this is kind of similar to to this ultramassive one we're talking about. This isn't a black hole that's feeding or accreting and producing a lot of light. This is another quiet black hole, but we can see it because it's in orbit around another star. So we see the, the companion star wobbling backwards and forwards on the sky as it goes in orbit with, um, with its black hole companion. So an um, another, another, another way the... to find another, another set of that parameter space, I guess, of, of black holes. Yeah. Um, and then on the more violent end of um, <laughs> previously invisible black holes, um, another intermediate mass black hole, actually, so not quite a supermassive one, but a little bit smaller, um, was discovered by some astronomers recently because it uh, tore apart and ate a star that wandered too close. <laughs> <laughs> so this quiet little black hole suddenly lights up into mm. this bright light source as this star gets shredded up and... Uh, and falls into it. Interesting. Um, I'll add. I'll add a link to that one. I. I. I, I must. Have, I must have missed that one. So, very, very interesting. So, so it, it's quiet. It's not accreting, and then this this star just barrels across, and there you go. Lots of yeah. lots of light coming out. Pretty much. Yeah. We we think that in 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 any galaxy, about once every ten thousand years, a star is going to get too close to the black hole in the center and get shredded apart. But <laughs> once in 10,000 years isn't a lot, but there's a lot of galaxies there's out there. Gal there's a lot of galaxies out there to see. Um, another one I came across, um, we'll just quick fire these, I guess, was Hubble seeing a possible runaway black hole creating a trail of stars. So this is a, a black hole that, or a supermassive black hole that seems to have been thrown out of its out of its galaxy. Can you tell us a, a little bit about that? Maybe if you picked yeah, up. Yeah, this was an interesting one. So, so we haven't actually found the black hole here. But um, what, what this group of astronomers found was a weird ridge-like structure in the stars in a galaxy. So it looked like the, the, the stars in a certain bit of the galaxy had kind of been pulled together into this, this kind of ridge that you can, you can maybe see there in the, the cartoon. Um, and, the, and this is kind of a her that's weird kind of discovery and when you see these things you sort of try and think of all the possible things that that could have caused this anytime you see a sort of anis anisotropy like that i guess you're like mm, something something seems to have occurred here because it's not symmetrical yeah pretty much um, and the most exciting theory for how this comes about is that when a um, a black hole gets kicked out of the center of the galaxy as that black hole travels, the gravity pulls stuff towards it, and that's what leaves this this kind of rigid okay. stars. So the mass is getting pulled so violently towards it, sort of in its wake, that it, it sort of seeds star formation behind it. If you, if, if... Um, maybe, or just just disturbs the okay. stars around it. And yeah, so it, it either forms stars around it by by compressing the gas, or just pulls just pulls stuff in its wake. You don't. To be fair, you don't need a black hole to do this. Anything massive flying through a galaxy okay. will. Um, we'll do this, but <laughs> so how how could um, just very quickly because I know I know you have to go soon. How how could you get a a black hole thrown out of its own galaxy? So this so the way the way to do this is uh, well, there's two ways you can do this, but one of the um, to, so the one way is when you have a star that comes to the end of its life and it blows up in a supernova explosion. Um, if that star is in a binary with another star or a black hole, then just the force of that supernova mm -hmm. explosion can blow the binary apart and it can, can throw stuff out. Um, the other way you can do this are in what's called globular clusters. So this is where you have a whole bunch of stars that are all bound together by gravity living close together. Um, I mean, the, one of the most famous examples of these are things like the Pleiades in the, in the sky. So you, you see these, these clusters of stars that, that live together. And when stars and black holes and other things that, that are in there are all living together and orbiting around each other by the force of gravity, um, some complicated things can end up happening. Um, you don't just get these nice simple orbits, but occasionally the, the tugging on one object from all the others yeah can be enough to throw one of them out the system. Interesting. So we can get these these very uh, violent throwing out events and maybe maybe this is a black hole that's on the end of this. How are they going to confirm that? Is there any 
Is there any way that they can do that? I guess if it's just flying off into interstellar space, you're just sort of very difficult to to know what's on the end there if you're yeah so the, the two ways you can do this are well the first one is kind of looking at all the models that could have produced this ridge and yeah. finding that the, the black hole is the one that, that best matches what we mm. see um, and then if you were really lucky you could maybe find the black hole flying off on the end <laughs> and i guess the best way to do that is kind of similar to the approach we were talking about with lensing yeah. There's a, another way, so, so we were talking about strong lensing today. So when you've got a galaxy that's distorting an image into this, this ring. Um, lensing also happens on a much smaller scale. It's called micro lensing. And this has been used to, to discover small black holes in our galaxy. And um, micro lensing isn't lensing by a whole galaxy, but it's lensing by individual stars or individual black holes. Um, and, and when microlensing happens, you don't get these big distorted images, but you see these magnifications, these little brightenings of stars nearby. So if you were lucky, maybe you could you could find some uh, some microlensing from this black hole as it runs away. Very 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 interesting. So lots and lots of fun things going on in the in the black hole field. Dan, we'll have to get you back again soon, and we can we can discuss even more. But for now. I'd like to thank you very, very much for for again taking your time to 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 talk to us about this. Is there anywhere where you'd like to send people so that they can learn more about this fascinating topic or maybe the the work that you're doing? Um, I guess the I mean, always a good place to start are the the press releases for the these new discoveries. So the um, the press release for um, for the article about this this ultramassive black hole will will have lots of good information in it and links to the original paper and um, um and lots of related materials um i always like the um sort of the nasa black hole websites yeah. as well um and i try and link to all of those on my own website yeah. danwilkins.net um, and on my twitter as well when i see interesting stuff come up at uh, dr dan wilkins awesome i will make sure all of those links are down in the description make sure you check out what Dan is doing over on his website and over on Twitter. As I say, all those um, links will be below in the description. Dan, thank you so much again for taking the time. I really, really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully when something exciting comes up again, which it seems to do very, very frequently in the black hole field, we can get you back and have another chat. Of course. Always a pleasure, Sam. Always a pleasure, buddy. Take, uh, take care and have a, have a wonderful afternoon and wonderful evening. You too. It's a lot. Take care, buddy. Bye now. Bye. I want to know what you think, because you're the scholars of enlightenment that I do this for. So please take a moment, if you wish, to let me know down in the comment section. And if you like this video, please consider leaving a like, subscribing, setting up notifications, and sharing this video more widely. I can't tell you how much these simple actions help me out and how much I'd appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being scientific. Thanks for being bad.